look back in hindsight Everything is 2020 in hindsight We make mistakes, we're learning from the in hindsight be yours today and your tomorrow In hindsight is so much clearer now Hey, welcome to Hindsight, the podcast. I'm your host, Lee Jones, and today I'm joined with Thomas Wilson, a professional writer, advocate, storyteller, and speaker. With over a decade of experience, Thomas has helped many individuals and communities share their stories and find their voices. So let's dive into the importance of self-discovery and how Thomas's work has made a difference. Welcome, Thomas. How are you doing today? Welcome as well. Thank you for having me on. <laughs> I am. I think I've got those mid-morning kind of grogs going on, but I think all of us do at this time of day. So yeah. I know I got you up out of bed pretty early today, so I appreciate <laughs> I appreciate you coming on and taking a moment to talk with us here on on Hindsight the Podcast. Thank you for having me on. Absolutely. Now, Thomas, he is the founder of RNH Creative Advocacy and Storytelling, specializing in shared storytelling with over a decade of experience. Like I said earlier, creating impactful content across Colorado. So besides uh, you being a little groggy this morning, uh, tell me a little bit about yourself. What what got you into storytelling? Definitely. So I, I've been in love with storytelling in the written word ever since I was real little. Um, I have had so many people read to me when I was a kid. My that was a big thing my parents did. That was one of my all-time favorite activities. Um, but to kind of speed up a little bit on that, because I don't want to take too long going way back. <laughs> I, I remember a pivotal point in wanting to be a storyteller is when my mom took me to a storytelling festival when I was in New England. Um, and I was exposed to a storyteller called Odds Bodkins, uh, who read, who did an entire narrative of the Odyssey. Hmm. I loved it. I was always one of those kids that loved mythology. And when I heard that, I remember that day looking at my mom and said, I'm gonna be a storyteller. And I've published a few books. I've done various different events around poetry and things, but um, to speed up even more, I've been in healthcare for about 12 years now, maybe more. But when in 2021, I was at a point in my life where I really decided I needed a change. I needed something to add to my life that was going to give me a little bit more fulfillment, a little bit more concentration and a creative passion. And so when I was at a point one evening, I was trying to think of something that would motivate me, make me happy. And I went, I'm going to be a storyteller. And uh, in that moment, I was a little sad. As soon as I said those words, my heart rose up in my chest. Um, I felt those tingles of excitement. And I decided to open my business about 10 days after that. Uh, since then, when I opened it, I was originally just opened in about mid-2022. Um, had my first client in fall of 2022 doing uh, D&D. And... It has been just a glorious rise since then. Uh, I have landed so many more clients. I've done so many Dungeons and Dragons events, storytelling. Uh, my business is growing rapidly. And a big part of that is because a focus of it is to match to those kiddos who want to hear stories. But it's also a focus around neurodiversity, around mm -hmm. empowering people and helping us connect to the idea that stories have been all around as long as human beings, like cave paintings, traditions, all of these things are tied to storytelling. And storytelling is what helps us connect to our humanity, mm. what helps us connect to our fellow human beings, and what drives so many of us in our passions. And while working with the neurodiverse community, the other big thing I try to do is acknowledge that my voice is not the only one that should be heard. And working with individuals that are so often silenced and helping them raise their voice, find their passion, and be able to chase what they want in life. Yeah. Now explain what a neuro, what, what was it, neurodiverse? Neurodiverse. Yeah, yeah. What, explain that to me. Definitely. So I will say I am not a, um, I'm not an expert necessarily on the medical side. I definitely okay. have more of a creative aspect, but neurodiversity is the simplest way I can put it is it is a way in which the brain processes information. It can be tied to autism, AD, oh, I don't know if the word ADD is even used anymore, but a variety of diagnosis, a variety of birth 
things like my own personal neurodiversity is tied to my ADHD, mm -hmm. my autism, and it's how the brain processes information, how it thinks do things. Um, and I'm sure there are people who can give a much more clinical answer, a much more expressive one. Mm -hmm. But to add my own little flair of it, it is just, it's a difference that impacts the brain, but also adds a lot of beauty to it in that there are complications, but there is also this resounding creative aspect that comes from that. As many people with neurodiversity can be nerds or writers or painters, and there's actually a very strong correlation to creativity mm -hmm. um, and creative talent with neurodiversity. Right. Awesome. So Dungeons and Dragons. Mm -hmm. telling stories now I've, I've gone into comic book shops because i like comic books and and i see the tables in the back of the you know of the uh facility and they're playing i guess they're playing dungeons and dragons that's what i'm assuming so tell me a little bit about dungeons and dragons i know the overall concept of it and things but how do you incorporate this role-playing game into telling stories that could help a neurodiverse community so to include yourself right yeah yeah so a lot of people who have played Dungeons and Dragons know that it is, it is a great game built around self-advocacy, public mm. speaking, mindfulness, creative expression. But for those who don't know, this is a game that is very much like turn-based. You sit at a table, you roll dice, um, and you basically use your imagination to tell, um, and I love this term, shared storytelling elements. It is something, so for a real rudimentary basic, I as the game master would tell a story, ask people to roll specific dice, and they would make decisions based around those dice. Now, okay. for a little bit more complex, this game involves things like dragons, it involves gremlins, goblins, wizards, and things. And it is all built around the idea of role-playing the character, playing someone else, mm -hmm. but also being able to kind of have a bit of escapism, but also a realm of, what is the word I want to use? I would say creative exploration. You go through tunnels, you go through systems. And in that, in the work that I do, I use these games, these maps, these ideas to help people develop their problem solving skills, their creative decision making skills, their mindfulness skills. And it's all built around the philosophy. Active, mindful questions set in the setting can mm -hmm. actually empower people. Uh, with the dice, there's math. And I find that I've helped people develop their math skills oh. by simply rolling dice, helping them add them together, and then throwing some complexity to it. But I find the most helpful aspect is that role playing. It gives people the opportunity to play something else, be someone else, mm -hmm. go through a setting, maybe hack and slash if they so want ever after a stressful week. But they also don't have to deal with the real world outcomes of making bad decisions. They can practice things that they may not do, or they may even be able to practice public speaking in front of a people, a group of friends, and help to practice leadership by leading the group. It's really this complex idea that can really be boiled down into a beautiful simplification through a board game that may last an hour and a half or longer. Yeah, yeah. Well, wow. so... Let's get back to storytelling. Do you only do you only utilize storytelling during D and D, or are there other ways that you utilize? Because you said, "Hey, I want to be a storyteller," mm -hmm. right? So, are there other ways that you utilize storytelling in any other ways of life? And I and I, I bring this up because I just recall, you know, talking to my team, and I'm saying, "Hey, you know, we get a lot of data, and we want to take that data and." tell the story that we want to tell with the day right not to get mm -hmm. too deep into it so is there a way that you're like hey you know step one look at the story step two you know some sort of system that you're using storytelling to help others to communicate better if that makes sense yeah so i have a background as a peer specialist um also okay. in healthcare a variety of other trainings and so one way that i help people tell stories is actually a very empathy based and person centered mindset. Yeah. So I take a lot of those psychological foundations and then apply them in a strength based mindset as well as a it's not necessarily clinical, but a psychology based mindset. So I acknowledge where I can pick up on the tones, the 
body language, the expressions of the people I use at my tables or at my events show. Mm -hmm. So I can be able to process that and help encourage and redirect where they may need to go. I also work very hard. I've had a lot of training in communication. I'm working with the communities that I do. I've learned certain elements of communication outside of just body language where like, and I'm trying to exhibit it now where my tone is pretty even. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I'm trying to make sure to make good eye contact. But one of the things I've learned is I know this isn't taught as much about making good eye contact, but a lot of people really struggle with the making eye contact. They struggle not having something in their hands when they're processing, listening to something. So I always encourage fidget toys or a phone. Mm. Um, and the reason I do that is because there are so many people that if they don't have something to at least divert some of their attention, yeah. they're not going to be able to pay attention at all. And the other core things that I use are also the mentality of what I wanted to see as a youth that I wasn't exposed to a lot, which were things like being patient, being willing to calmly redirect. If there's conflict, mm -hmm. I am able to approach it with a directness, but also a patience. So I never try to make people feel horrible about their decisions. I am able to talk through things with an even tone, with a kindness. And then after that conflict is resolved, I go back and I make sure that everyone gets to see the strengths that they exhibited in that conflict resolution. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of really complex tactics that I'm mentioning here, but I found they're all incredibly useful. Um, and the last thing I would always really say is a big part of my work is centered around listening. I find that in today's day and age, there's a lot less listening going on than I think there should be. So if someone wants to express an idea, I listen attentively. With, with intention, with mindfulness. And if it's something that I think will really work, I bounce off of that and develop that idea with them. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope that all kind of explains that clearly. Oh yeah, absolutely. Hey, so can you describe like a successful sensory friendly event that you facilitated for neurodivergent and mental health uh, communities? I definitely can. Good, um, good. So my, my parameters of success might be different than a lot of other people's. Um, and this is the form that I'm going to mention is very similar to a lot of what I do and how I do it, where my focus of success is not necessarily about making a ton of money. It's not necessarily about making sure that I'm praised heavily after it. My parameters of success around the neurodiverse mental health community are really those moments when the people with those needs are excited, they want to show up again. So an example of this is, I'll go back to Dungeons & Dragons because I do this a little more frequently, um, and I'll talk about a group I don't always talk about on podcasts. I have an adult D&D group that I've been running for a long time now. I think it's been over a year. We had our, our celebration game not that long ago. And the system in which I use, I use Meetup for this. I'm part of a group. And there was a moment I was running a game. We were been in this campaign for a while. And I just sat down and I made sure that the tone was good. The sensory elements were good. I kept my awareness on making sure not to jar any triggers for my audience. I made sure not to, uh, you know, put music in that would be overwhelming or lighting mm -hmm. or things like that. But really, I think one of the biggest successes I would have is there's an individual who has loved the event, has been there the longest, and he just started smiling, just like bright, genuine smile was laughing and it was a point where there's some stuff going on in the background and as soon as i saw that we had even chatted a little bit after about why he was laughing and things like that and i just went this is why i do it this moment of release for this individual this moment of happiness this moment of i have stuff going on but i am free to express something i want to that's one success and mm -hmm. it was wonderful mm -hmm. because not only did he rate the event five stars, but he just seems so excited to be there next time. Mm -hmm. Another example um, is when I run, a few months ago, I had a group of 12 youth at a youth D&D game. There was so much chaos going on in the game. But what really made it a success for me was even though there was 12, 13 kids, I was the only person providing care. I was able to attentively pay attention to each person 
their mm-hmm. needs. I was able to listen, reflect, keep the group going. I was able to create scenarios where they burst out laughing. On our break, they were excited and everybody wanted to talk to me with their ideas of what they wanted to do in the game. Even the people who were stressed out over time, they became jovial. They started suggesting ideas. I, there was mm. one individual and he said, I have an idea to make this game better. And I just smiled because I mm-hmm. love the honesty of the community. Um, and at the end of the day, I was exhausted. I was tired. But the youth were, after the game was done, they were talking amongst each other. They were playing. They were doing art on the board and telling me about it. And I know that doesn't necessarily seem like the biggest deal to some people. But for me, that was also the idea that I was creating a space that honored people's sensory needs, that helped them to be their Mm. truest self without fear of judgment, and really helped to solidify that they had a community space where they were safe, they were happy, and they were just so excited to continue hearing stories. Yeah, yeah. Those are great, great examples. I appreciate you sharing those. Having a space where you can open up and kind of just feel joy Mm -hmm. is, is very important, right? Because we're looking at neurodivergency, but everyone has stresses and, and different types of things that are that are nipping at them right mm-hmm. constantly and, and we all look to find some sort of release and I think maybe a lot of people don't but they should look to find some sort of release and for you to be able to put this thing together and, and have that release have that opportunity that space for your for your fellow players I don't know what did it, what do we call them your fellow players to go out and and start to think and create and just be more uh, you know attentive and they're probably listening and learning and wanting to do more things too it's just a great space and, and definitely appreciate that great work that you're doing out there what inspired your books glimmer of the soul and reverie of the lost notes so I wrote those books. Those books were at a very different point in my life. Um, okay. That was, oh my gosh, Glimmer of a Soul. I was actually just exiting high school when I got that published. And the others, I was probably in my early teens. Mm-hmm. And for me, it's it's wild to me to think of the person I was then versus now. And not necessarily in a bad way, but in the like, wow, I've grown so much from this uh-huh. kind of way. So when I wrote the first book, I was still really struggling with my mental health. Okay. Um, and as similar with the others, and I'm not gonna be honest, mental health is a daily grind. You have to be willing to put in the effort every day. But those books were really inspired by my experiences with my father in particular, as well as the school system and living through those scenarios as someone who is part of a community, as someone who has been told many times that I'm too loud, that I'm too angry, that I'm too disruptive. All of these things from programs and individuals who were supposed to support me, but didn't really offer a lot of that. Mm -hmm. And so those books are inspired from those experiences. They're poems designed to help connect people going through experiences like that, being Mm -hmm. able to explore the pain, but also persevering through any kind of lived experience. And I think the coolest things that I have ever experienced with those books was one event that really stands out to me was I was at a bookstore signing one day. And they had just gotten the paper. There were two people who had shown up. One of them had just lost her husband. Another had been going through her own scenario. And I read a poem. At the end of it, the woman who had just lost someone was crying. And she looked me in the eye and said, I was meant to be here. Your words really helped me. Uh, And that was wonderful in itself. But after that, both of the women started talking with me. And at the end of the day, we had gone over the inspiration for the poem. We had gone over our own mutual pain. But those two women had actually connected Um, Mm -hmm. gave each other the phone number and they decided they were going to leave and keep in communication, keep Mm -hmm. talking to one another, keep exploring what their pain was like, what their scenario is like. And I hope those two people 
are still communicating to this day. Mm -hmm. Because to me as a writer, that's like the perfect explanation of how my work can impact people. Mm -hmm. It is this, it is, you know, I'm never going to be the rich and famous author. I'm never going to be the rich and famous business owner, partly because of the work I do. But for me to find people that my work can genuinely connect to and inspire, even if it never makes thousands of dollars, that is the best thing that I can think I can do with my writing. Beautiful. Beautiful. All right. You mentioned you had some difficulties in school with just how the system is set up. So how do you believe businesses and, and communities could better support neurodivergent and uh, mental health communities through storytelling? Oh, I love that question. So for me, I would say the first thing is, and this is a big one, and I know that you know, there's kind of these gaps and things, but the big one is stop labeling youth as the problem client or the problem student. Um, I grew up with that label a lot in my life. And what I have found is once you do that, that individual has a really hard time recovering from that mentality. Mm -hmm. That mentality puts them in the corner. That mentality separates them from their peers. That mentality makes them closer to leaving the sessions, leaving the program quicker. It also, and I think this is a really big thing, which is that program stops individuals from providing the same level of care that they might offer their peers. And mm -hmm. I truly believe that not only because I witnessed it, but because even for a profit business, I'm a for a profit business. I understand some of the complications, mm -hmm. but once you start looking at that person as a problem or too disruptive, you're not going to treat them the same as you see right. people who you think are excellent, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, another big one I would say is build your programs more around the people that you're trying to help. I find a lot of organizations and part of the reason I am a for profit is to challenge the conception that for profits are there just to make money that they can't mm -hmm. do good compared to a charity, but start building your programs around the people. Um, I know a lot of organizations do do this, but when you build your program around what you as the provider necessarily want to see or the money that you want to make it have coming in, you lose that connection to the people you're helping. You lose that like, this is for them versus this is for me as the provider or this is for my paycheck. And very similar to the problem mentality, there's a disconnect. There's a very strong like, oh, this becomes my paycheck and that's just it. Or this is the program and these people are failing the program versus the program is failing these people. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very different mentality and it leads to very different outcomes. And I think just adding to both of those, once you slip into that precarious mindset, it can be a very quick descent into some very problematic behavior just from the providers and the organization. Mm -hmm. I hear you. Hey, but to be fair, I mean, sometimes you got to think about the money, right? Absolutely. You, yeah. Because you need <laughs> to be able to support the goal that you're trying to achieve as well. So, uh, so there's a lot of dynamics in the for-profit mm -hmm. and I guess the... Uh, nonprofits, you know, way of business. But I love your answer, though. I love your answer because the bottom line is you cannot lose focus on why you're doing it in the first place. And I right. Say, and it's for the people. Uh, I will say all of my answers, there is no definitive answer for every scenario. Everything Absolutely. is different. Um, and I have experience, but I do not know what 90% of other people are going through out in the world or more right now. So yeah, my answers are very much based on my experience, and I hope I am not making anyone listening feel bad. The people, the listeners are looking for perspectives, right? They're looking for experiences that you've went to and maybe connecting with those, like those two young ladies that came and talked to you at the book sign. And so there's a lot of things that may not be exactly alike to your point, but there are a lot of similarities, right? And we can all take if we're open to it, we can all take some some of your knowledge, some of your experiences and some of your solutions and hopefully apply them to some of the things that we're going through as well. So absolutely. I appreciate you uh, kind of setting it straight, setting me straight with that. Hey, but what advice do you have for those struggling to find their passion? How do you think storytelling could help them out? So much that I could give. Um, 
And there's so many, I love that question as well. I would say, and there's, I want to preface this. I think like a lot of people right now, they're hopping on YouTube because they want to be that influencer or Instagram um, to find their passion. They see something that works for other people. Two bits of advice I would give is just because something works for someone else does not necessarily mean that's going to work for you. Mm -hmm. But the thing that I would follow up about in finding your passion and storytelling, I would definitely say go where your strengths are but be willing to try numerous things. Um, there is so much beauty in, I think, in the stumbling of finding your passion, right? Mm -hmm. The ability to go over time and find what you want. But in both of those, I would also say, just because something works for someone else and it fails for you, don't feel bad. Like that, I know it's really hard. To, it's easier to say that than experience it. But like I have, I have my own thing. I spent time on YouTube. It didn't work out the way I wanted it to. I've done a lot of different things. But part of the beauty of my stumbling in that is I found something that worked for me. I found something I was mm. passionate about. I tried a lot of things. And I, I'll be honest with you, I've had a lot of success outside of social media. And to kind of wrap that up, just because you have something that doesn't work out in one way doesn't mean it can't work out another way. You got to try. You got to explore and I think, you know, we have so much centering around, this is how it works. This is how this works. And if it doesn't work for you, it's not going to work in general. Mm -hmm. And I think there's so many people who have so many talents that are outside of those high profile careers that they can do really well in. But people so often cut people off and say it didn't work. So it's never going to work. Yeah. Um, and so in that, I would just say, be willing to stumble, be willing to try other avenues, chase your passion in ways you never thought you could because it can work out so well. Yeah, that is great advice. Uh, a lot of times you fail in things. And we, we look at failing as a negative, but it's really not if you have the right mindset mm -hmm. to approach it. Uh, you gave a great example. You've tried some things that didn't work out, but in trying it, you found something that did work mm -hmm. out for you. You found out, okay, well, this isn't going to work in this way. So maybe I need to change it up a little bit, do it this way, because I have strengths and experiences and knowledge and you know, empathy and compassion, and I can throw it from this perspective. And now you tweak it and make it work, whatever it could be. So bottom line is don't become stagnant. Don't become beat down just because things aren't working right at the time, or you failed at this particular thing. Like there's so many things that you can do and that you are meant to do more importantly. So just go out and find that thing and don't, don't get upset. I love that. That's great advice. So how do empathy, I mentioned that again, empathy and compassion-based care sustain share storytelling? I like when you, you know, I had a bunch of questions. I mean, maybe it wasn't questions, but some statements that I was going to make about storytelling and back in the day and the cave people and how we use storytelling to promote knowledge and to not really promote it, but to keep things in the heads, right? That's how we learn. Now we have computers, we got books, we got all this other stuff. But back in the day, it was just through telling stories, right? In uh, neurodivergency, D&D uh, &D space, uh, give me a, just a little bit more on what your fans, your listeners, your students, your fellow players, what do they take away from the activity, playing the game, from storytelling events? What can they take away from those sessions and apply in their world? Like, what is your vision for that? So I think the biggest things on a su more superficial level, and I hate saying mm -hmm. superficial because I think it detracts a little bit until I say what I say, um, mm -hmm. is they get that peer engagement. They get that quality storytelling. They mm -hmm. get to have active play, which is so important, even if it's different than how a lot of people see it. Mm -hmm. But on a more deep level, I've watched my players build their confidence. I've watched them practice mindful interactions. I've watched them practice complex ideas. And within all of that, I think the real thing that they take away from it, other than that safe space mentality and that confidence, is the joy, the mm -hmm. the the serenity, the confidence that comes from having a good story, getting to make fun decisions, getting to explore ideas, but it also comes from knowing that they've been supported, knowing that they've been able to practice skills and maybe not even realizing that they've even done any real life development. A lot of what I try to do is to make my events as fun as possible mm -hmm. so people don't have to 
think that they're practicing math all the time or they're in like a therapy session or in a school session um and it's all built around that idea that joy and play and all of these things are great human deterrent to depression to anxiety comparing yourself to other people and i mentioned that storytelling helps us to connect to our humanity and i see that every time i run an event because I think it also instills real self-worth in people. It instills mm -hmm. a mindfulness that people feel like they can go do something, but they can do it more capably. And there's even this idea for some of my people that once they've made a decision and they get to see something wacky or, or something play out, that they know how to better handle real life scenarios. Like if there's conflict or someone says you can't do this, they feel more confident saying, yes, I can. And I'll prove it to you. Mm. Or even the confidence of, I don't need to get upset because someone right. says something I don't like. Awesome. Um, I can stay calm. I have this skill that I didn't even realize I practiced. Um, so those are some of the biggest things. One more superficial, I would say, and again, superficial is kind of a lack for a better word, is the idea that they've met new people. They've been able to play with friends and that they have somewhere to go either mm -hmm. every couple of weeks, every month space that they're excited to be at. I find a lot of people, adults and youth alike, we don't have a lot of spaces we can go to anymore mm. that are like sensory friendly, that are, we're, we're genuinely excited to go to. And so for this, that excitement in and of itself is a takeaway that they get to be there and mm. they get to do something they love. All right, Thomas, thank you. Amazing answers. I've asked you a few questions, some short, some super long and crazy. But is there anything else you'd like to discuss that we haven't covered already? The only thing that I, I would say, um, and I mentioned this briefly, I know that in the D&D world, in a lot of world, a lot of people are looking at this to be their big break or their, their way of making, you know, making a ton of money. And I touched on this a little bit earlier too. I would just advise if you're going in to do the work that I'm doing, um, this is not going to ever make me rich and famous. It's just not going to because that pursuit is going to detract so much from what I'm trying to do. But if you want to do real good in the world, you want to try something like that fumbling. You want to try something that you're new at. I would just say, do it with your heart open and your ears ready to listen. Because there are so many people who do events like I do, public speaking, D&D, storytelling, and they get an ego about them. They get this mentality that they're really good and there's they just stop listening. And I will tell you right now, that will kill any career you're trying to have in this work. Because it not only is an ego thing, but it's a, it's a selfishness that will, people will know and they will pick up really quickly. And you may have success over that, but you will see that. So I just right. highly recommend we need more people in this work, but we need more people with those components. Love it. Love it. Hey, and where can the, the listeners or the watchers, the viewers, where can they find out more about you, Thomas, and, and the work that you're doing? Absolutely. So I will say that I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, you can find me. Uh, I'll make sure that my LinkedIn is passed along. I'm also on Instagram at RH Storytelling. Make sure that I pass along. But mm -hmm. I have so many more programs and things happening from camps and classes and from Skillshare all over. So I'll make sure my link tree is in there. And I'll also make sure you have my email, which is ndttrpg at gmail. I realize that's a lot of very similar sounding letters, so I'll make sure that's passed <laughs> along. But I am a huge believer in the power of questions and that it yeah. is so important to be able to ask them. So if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me through email as well. Hey, thank you, Thomas sharing your story and the insights on self-discovery and storytelling. Uh, your work has clearly made a significant impact. And for our listeners, if you're inspired by Thomas's story, take that first step and share your own. Tune in to future episodes of Hindsight the Podcast for more inspiring conversations. And subscribe now and never miss an episode. Thanks again, Thomas. Thank you. Hey, thanks for joining me here on Hindsight the Podcast. I'm your host, Lee Jones. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I know I did. And while I have you here, 
why don't you take your mouse and go over and click on that subscribe button? No, no, not right there. Over to the right. To, no, no, down, down, right, right there. Boom. Thank you. Now, thank you for subscribing to Hindsight the Podcast. I'm your host, Lee Jones.